Okay. Looks like you should be good to go. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you, Amy. Uh, so, uh, Larry, welcome. Uh, my name's Kevin Brofly. I'm the Army Sustainment Command Historian uh, at Rock Island Arsenal here. And uh, today we'll be talking about uh, chemical warfare use in uh, World War One. So uh, feel free if um, at any point, if you have any questions, uh, you can raise your hand there and, and I'm, I'm happy to answer them or we can answer them at the end. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I like talking about um, the origins of things. And, you know, we always think about World War One being, you know, the origin of chemical warfare. Well, uh, not necessarily in, in, in its in its state and uh, technological advances it was, uh, but some of the first recorded uses of chemical warfare uh, you know, dates all the way back to the Peloponnesian War of approximately 431 BC. And, you know, these were obviously really rudimentary, uh, you know, chemical warfare um, aspects. And, and it was just, a, you know, something that they were seeking an advantage over their enemy. And so actually what it was was a mix of, uh, like it says here, wood, pitch and sulfur. And uh, there are various accounts of them setting this on fire and, it, you know, it would create fumes coming off of it that could um, overwhelm your enemies. Uh, but then again, we, we, we hear about um, similar things being done during the Roman Persian Wars in uh, 92 BC to 627 AD. Um, and it's kind of the, the, you know, the same sort of thing. In this case, it was uh, bitume and uh, sulfur com uh, combined to create sulfur dioxide. So it would actually off gas in that sense. Uh, there are also accounts of, uh, you know, chemical warfare, warfare being used in the, uh, the Crimean War, which is the picture down to the lower right. Uh, or, well, it's just a group of soldiers hanging out, but uh, drinking. Uh, but, uh, you know, you start seeing, uh, you know, different things being used or different tactics being used uh, in this case in the Crimean War and, and throughout the Civil War as well. Uh, you see small accounts of it, nothing um, in any large scale in that sense. But um, the first large scale application is, you know, what we see and what we're talking about today uh, is in 1914 against the uh, the Central by the Allies. But um, again, a little bit more background. In 1899, the Hague conferences really, uh, 19, uh, 1899 and 1907, that were two conferences. Uh, these conferences really uh, set out what we know today as the rules of war. And, uh, you know, going from the size of bullets to, you know, uh, banning the use of triangular bayonets and, and things like that, that things that were deemed as um, inhumane to be used in warfare. And I know, I know that you look at it, it's like, well, it's warfare. I mean, what do you consider to be humane in that sense? Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, uh, during these conferences, like it says here in 1899, uh, that included causes on chemical weapons. And, and the actual quote was declaration concerning the prohibition of use of projectiles with the sole object to spread asphy asphyxiating ga uh, poisonous gases. Um, and, you know, it, it was designed to, again, to prevent things that were seen as inhumane in these senses and gas warfare and, and you know, things that might cause uh, wounds that, would never heal and, and things like that were, were the main focus of these, these conferences. Um, and most, um, most nations signed onto these rules. Uh, but again, as we go on, we see, you know, exceptions being made. And then obviously, um, you know, everybody's looking for an edge to get, you know, over your enemy. And so, you know, sometimes rules were uh, pushed aside in, in some cases. Um, but, the first actual use of chemical warfare was actually by the Allies uh, in, in 1914. And, uh, but it wasn't a, a poisonous chemical gas. It was just more what we know as chemical irritants. Um, and they were actually being used by a 26 millimeter grenades uh, by the French army. And, and then the British started using it. And uh, they uh, started de uh, deploying some of these chemical irritants by, by shell fire or artillery fire. And but in much smaller quantities, um, and you know, then the Germans reciprocate, and, uh, so it kind of starts this ball rolling. And as we get bogged down into this trench warfare that we know so well, and uh, later in 1914 and 1915, and, and these um, 
uh, you know, in in movable lines. You know, you, you start seeing these multiple lines of trenches and you start seeing, uh, you know, again, looking for that advantage over your enemy. Um, so the picture to the top right is actually uh, a little bit later in the war, but showing, um, you know, a, uh, a tear glass cloud, what they actually they continue to use throughout the war. Uh, but it eventually lost favor for uh, the poisonous aspect. So obviously, but uh, the shells down below, we'll see again uh, later in the in the presentation. But uh, the the one to the left, which just has all liquid inside, would uh, the shell would explode and then make a cloud of uh, of liquid gas, uh, and and that's a lot of times how the tear gas was um, employed. And then the one to the right is the more poisonous gas style shell. Uh, where you actually have a bottle inside that would, uh, when the shell exploded, it would mix the two uh, chemicals and create the poisonous gas. Uh, but um, uh, but it was such a small percentage that it was, you know, it almost went unseen, uh, and, and neither side really saw any advantage to it, uh, you know, or any tactical advantage. But uh, with seeing these these applications of chemical irritants. Uh, a German ke uh, chemist named Fritz Haber, you know, basically sees an advantage here. And, and um, like it says, Germany was really leading in the world's uh, scientific de development of, uh, you know, pesticides and, and chemical testing and, and, and things like that. And, you know, when he started suggesting using some of these pesticides or, or poisonous chemicals, uh, to be used in warfare, uh, you know, and starting to be questioned, saying this is inhumane and, and you know, quoting some of the, the, you know, the Hague Convention or the rules of war, you know, he states here, <laughs> like, death is death, no matter how it's inflicted. And and not giving any credence to the fact that, you know, you could suffer a terrible, um, excruciating death um, all in the process. But <laughs> in his eyes, in the end, you died, didn't matter how you got there. Um, and so really in 18, uh, 1914, they start working on um, how to weaponize these uh, these poisonous chemicals that they had been working on and, and pesticides, um, or as some people have called it, it, it would become a human side uh, in this case. Um, but uh, by 1915, um, you know, the they'd really created an effective deployable poisonous gas um, and and really their first uh, attempt at this was chlorine gas because it was uh, it was much more stable in their in their sense to be deployed in um, across the uh, uh, the battlefield uh, oh I'm sorry uh, so the picture at the top right is Fritz Haber and then uh, he was given a commission after starting this work and the the uh, man in the red circle in the in the bottom is actually Fritz Haber um uh, showing how uh employment of this was uh, was taking place in the field so he actually was seeing at the front how um, effective his weapons were being so the very first major use of uh poisonous chemical uh would actually took place during the second battle of Ypres, uh on uh, 22 april uh more than six thousand steel ca uh, cylinders of chlorine gas were used and so the reason why the whole offensive started was that you know you had this uh uh, stalemate uh, again on the western front in and around the town of Deep. Uh, there was this bulge that the uh, the Germans had tried to uh, numerous times tried to uh, reduce and capture the town of Deep and and capture the rest of Belgium because uh, the Br British and the Belgian armies were just basically hanging on to a very small portion of the northwest corner of Belgium at this point. Uh, but additionally, the Germans and knowing that they were going to employ this chemical warfare. Uh, in releasing it from the cylinders, they had to wait for the perfect weather conditions um, and a, a predominant wind blowing to the west um, that was going to, you know, at least in uh, meteorological terms, was going to continue uh, and not have any uh, any shift in, or change in weather uh, because these were basically big, what you would see as oxygen, um, you know, containers, and they're just releasing it out of hoses that were placed up over the top of the trenches and the frontline trenches of the German soldiers were given gas masks, but uh, the rear and support lines, uh, the gas mask production hadn't fully been produced yet. And so there were soldiers in the rear that would, could be uh, susceptible to this. Uh, but uh, like it says here, within 10 minutes, 160 tons of chlorine gas had drifted into uh, joint 
French Canadian uh, trench lines. And you have to imagine that while some use of tear, uh, tear gas or chemical irritants been used, there was no development of gas masks on the, uh, the Western, on the Western allies. And so this would caught them by uh, incredible surprise. And uh, the thing that's more uh, shocking about this is that the, you know, some of the troops actually stood their ground. Um, and there was a chemist uh, that was within a Canadian unit uh, that was one of the first units to actually um, encounter the gas. And uh, once he'd identified that this was chlorine gas, uh, they started, he had started instructing his soldiers and it started getting spread down the line that uh, they could use uh, their field dressing, so bandages. And he knew that the uric acid in urine uh, could help seal uh, the bandage and put it, putting it over your mouth and nose that it could actually, um, you know, reduce the chances that you could uh, be affected by the chlorine gas. And so he started uh, this trend and, and surprisingly enough, the Canadians actually held their ground for a short period of time you know, in this thing that was seen as an un, a, impenetrable uh, or a, 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 uh, an attack that was undefendable. You know, you couldn't defend against this. All, you know, the Germans thought, well, we're going to charge across and we're going to find everybody dead or gone. You know, that they, they, they retreated. Um, and, uh, and it was devastating. But um, as we see so many times throughout history, you know, the Germans failed to fully exploit it. Um, so, the gas did affect, like I said, your 10,000 Allied soldiers, uh, more than which, uh, more than half of those who uh, died uh, within 10 minutes of exposure um, from, you know, the uh, the basically the chlorine gas burning their lungs, and you know, and, and a, a death by gas warfare was just terrible to imagine. And in, in this case, you know, these guys are actually drowning. Uh, it, it it chars or it, it uh, scars the inside of your lungs. And fluid starts building, and then you basically drown in your own um, in your own fluid. So it's it's a terrible death, a terrible way, and, and it feels uh, at least descriptions um, it say that it, it feels like you're drowning, um, you know, because it's it's basically the same effect. Uh, but it did open a, a four mile gap. Uh, the uh, um, like I said, the uh, uh, the Germans didn't fully exploit it. And so the second battle of Eve continues on until about May 25th. And really the Germans did gain some land, but the lines did not really progress uh, or change that much. And so this, this first employment of gas, which uh, did uh, continue over the several next days. Um, and uh, I think the second employment actually, uh, when they started releasing the gas, the winds changed. And the winds blew back onto the German army and and uh, started killing support line troops that were behind the trenches, frontline trenches that were not, uh, you know, it started killing German soldiers that were in support. Of uh, now, the world press comes out and, you know, deplores or, you know, decries of what the uh, the Germans had done, you know, saying that this was bloody murder. Uh, like it says here that the Daily Mail editorial said cold blooded deployment of every device of modern science. And even the Germans were uh, were you know decrying its use. Uh, uh, General Karl von Einem, uh, commander of the, Ger the Third German Army in France, said, "I fear it will produce a tremendous scandal in the world. War has nothing to do with chivalry anymore. The higher civilian uh, civilization rises, the more or the viler man becomes." And even Hans, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I totally mind blank on his name, but Hans. Uh, the uh, the inventor of the gas said, uh, you know, at first world will decry what we did, but then they will emulate what we did. And in it, in it he was right in that, is that, you know, as soon as uh, the British and the French um, armies realized what was going on, they started working to produce and reproduce what the Germans had done and, and try to get an edge over them again. Uh, but the British Expeditionary Forces, Sir John French, says that uh, uh, a cynical and barbarous disregard for the well-known usages of civilized war. And so there was, like I said, there were lots of these cries of uh, going against the Hague, uh, the Hague conventions and the rules of war and, and co just common um, humanitarian sense in, uh, in how we fight war. Uh, this picture to the top right shows the, uh, the French M2 gas mask uh, being given to children at near the front um, that were, in, in, you know, obviously behind the front, but were near the front that could potentially be affected by gas warfare. 
Uh, the bottom picture shows actually a, uh, a British advance across no man's land during a gas attack after um, some rudimentary gas masks were created. Um, so, <clears throat> like I said, the British and French both started immediately uh, working to develop their own gas warfare uh, techniques or uh, chemical warfare techniques. And you see here some of the, uh, the early French gas masks, basically the same thing, putting bandages or, you know, uh, over your mouth and nose and just trying to reduce the amount of, um, you know, um, exposure to it as well as wearing goggles. Uh, but uh, there was there there was some work on poisonous war or gas warfare prior to this point by the Western Allies, but it wasn't it wasn't an adopted uh, really in a large scale until after this. Um, and uh, like I said, the French using tear gas grenades in 1914, they'd already kind of taken the gloves off, uh, but not in a poisonous sense. Uh, but um, immediately, uh, you know, France and Britain started looking to, uh, you know, uh, chemistry schools and, 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 di and different things like that to try to say, hey, what can we do better here? How can we make this uh, more effective? Um, so the development Britain, the, the image down to the lower right actually shows uh, one of the first British gas attacks against the, the Germans here. But uh, uh, <clears throat> the British techniques were really looking, okay, this is what they did. How can we make it better? How can we make it more efficient? Um, and they continued this um, this research throughout the rest of the war. And like it says here, there's that, you know, even Britain was called on saying that, you know, they were using medical research facilities to conduct this research and weapons development um, on chemical uh, warfare, but it, it blurs the line, kind of like the, the death penalty and, and, you know, pharmacists saying that they don't want to provide chemicals that would be used for the death penalty because it uh, violates their Hippocratic oath. This was kind of the same arguments. And so they were seeing some medical schools and, and um, you know, production facilities not wanting to take part, but um, um, especially in Britain and France, they were militarized and, and made to take part. Uh, the United States, uh, it, again, at this point, is just an observer uh, seeing it. But we all we, we also start our own development and experimentation to a degree in this and trying to figure out what what's going on in Europe and and if we ever get involved, you know what we're going to have to do. With that. Um, but uh, again, we do the same thing. We start, uh, uh, you know, studying it. And like it says here, the United States declared war uh, in 1917. The National Research Council Subcommittee on Noxious Gases was appointed. And so we immediately start pouring uh, funds into, uh, you know, development and uh, improvements based upon European designs of gas warfare, but also, you know, how we can defend against it as well in a better way. Um, um, and again, by 1918, uh, early 1918, we, we kind of militarized our, our research as well uh, with over 1900 scientists and technicians um, involved in the chemical uh, warfare program here, um, which was the largest, re uh, at least chemical research program in the United States um, at this point. Um, and the pictures here show uh, both American soldiers um, practicing their uh, employment of gas masks. So as you can imagine, uh, the picture to the upper right shows uh, a variety of, of gas masks that were used. Uh, the first gas masks were very primitive. Um, like I said, that the, uh, um, you know, the, the, the Canadian soldiers on the front lines and then the French afterwards in the immediate um, aftermath of this uh, attack were just using bandages or pieces of the cloth that were wet or, or you know, had urine on them to try to uh, reduce the amount of gas exposure. Uh, very ineffective uh, in a lot of cases, but better than nothing, you know, you see. Uh, but the the second evolution of that is really, uh, if you can see my cursor here, is the hypo helmet. It was developed by the British. It's basically a, a treated canvas bag with glass uh, eye holes in the, uh, in the bag and then a, a breather valve. And very difficult to breathe in. Uh, the soldiers uh, talked about that, uh, you know, they could, if you were running or doing any kind of physical activity that you could barely breathe in it and that it was um, it it worked um, to a degree um, it was better than the the bandage in that it protected most of the skin on your face um, and head um, but um, you know even at that that the treatment of the uh, of the wool in the sense 
um, with use and, you know, taking it in and out and, and pulling it, that it was very susceptible to, to rips and tears and even, uh, you know, the chemical treatment, you know, basically wearing off of it. So it, it wasn't very effective for very long. Um, in the, the picture here, you'll see the, uh, the M2 French gas masks, which were the, some of the first gas masks the Americans used when we got to theater. Uh, the very the M1 gas mask actually still, uh, the very early ones still required you to urinate into it to have that uric acid to help uh, seal it. The later ones were, were treated better and uh, again, were very difficult to breathe in, but you didn't have to do that anymore. But it was, it was ironic and, and, uh, and funny as the Americans came into theater. Um, and we're meeting their French uh, trainers. The French trainers actually told them they still had to urinate into their masks. And, you know, you can see a bunch of Americans out there trying to get ready to a gas attack, peeing into their ga gas mask to, to get it to seal, uh, only to find out that they didn't. Uh, the M15 German gas mask was the very first mask that they used, um, and it was very effective. And even if you look at the, uh, the later American British uh, gas masks, the small box respirators, uh, the German gas mask had its own uh, filtration canister on the on the on the mask, and very similar to what you see uh, the Germans using in World War II in its in its design. Um, obviously, this was treated canvas. Uh, the later designs in World War II were actually rubber gas masks, but uh, uh, but nevertheless, very advanced design for the time, um, and really what they used throughout the war with little improvements. Um, I already talked about the French M1 and M2 gas mask. It was basically just a, a bag that fit over your face. You can see the picture here. Um, again, it, it didn't seal very well when you put it on. Um, if you can imagine putting a stiff bag onto your face, there were still gaps around your ears and sometimes around your chin and things like that. You had to really strap it on tight. Um, and uh, they were elastic straps uh, that would held it on. So over time, the elastic would, would weaken. Um, and it was very better than again the the previous designs, but uh, uh, difficult to um, to utilize. Plus, there was no filter in it, and uh, when you breathed in it, that condensation would build up in the glass eyelets uh, or you know eye rings, and uh, made it very difficult to see. And plus, at the same time, like the other mask, it was difficult to breathe in. Uh, the next model was the uh, the small box respirator, which is you, you see what these guys are wearing here. Um, and the one right here, uh, where there was actually, you wore a bag on your chest and there was a, a canister that sat inside the bag and the canister had a mixture of um, charcoal, walnut husks that were you know basically made into powder or very fine, uh, but a, a very good filter that we, th we don't think about as being a very good filter today, but uh, asbestos. Um, asbestos fibers were used in those. Um, now, obviously, it was on one side of the, uh, um, like the uh, the charcoal filter, and so you weren't really breathing in asbestos fibers. But um, I, I imagine it probably wasn't as as good for your health as you'd you'd think. But but considering the alternative it was better than dying of a chemical warfare attack. So, but that was the most effective gas mask uh, uh, developed by the British in 1916, but used throughout the rest of the war by the, both the uh, the British and the Americans when we come in. Uh, we make our own model of the small box respirator um, when we came in, uh, but just very small um, changes to it. Um, you know, it was more breathable. It's still, it's not something you want to go and run a marathon in, uh, but it was much more comfortable than all the previous masks. Uh, and, um, I'm kind of getting bogged down, I'm sorry. Uh, but these were the most common gases that you see. Uh, chlorine was, well, I'm sorry, tear, tear gas was the very first one. Uh, but again, not poisonous. Uh, there were there were no known fatalities from this. Chlorine was the next one that was used, uh, and they they think less than uh, you know they talk about uh, about five thousand of those ten thousand that were initially um, uh, exposed died. Uh, but medical research uh, has gone back, and they say that somewhere less than they think about eleven hundred so uh, individuals died from it. Uh, direct effects, other things, you know, burns on the skin or lesions um, ended up dying from that. Um, and on these, uh, you know, obviously just like being around a heavily chlorinated pool, it just smelled like what we know as chlorine. Uh, but some dis soldiers described it as being a distinctive mix of pepper and pineapple smell. Uh, now, the most common one 
And the one that most soldiers died from was was uh, phosgene gas. Uh, we always think about you know gas warfare, or chemical warfare being mustard gas, but phosgene was actually the far more effective killer, with eighty five percent of the uh, the all gas related fatalities occurring from phosgene gas. Uh, and part of the reason why is that chlorine comes across as a yellow green cloud. Phosgene gas is really uh, was colorless. Um, and so it could be very easily just, you know, mistaken for, you know, a, a foggy day or, or a cloud or a shell explosion or something like that. Um, and that the smell was also kind of a, um, you know, not disguised, but indistinct in, on what you can see on a battlefield. They said that uh, they would describe it as um, newly mown grass or hay. Um, and so really... Um, largely colorless and uh, an oily liquid but like it says here the major effects with this was that uh it would react with the proteins in your lung and uh, you know essentially causing the same thing uh causing eventual suffocation um uh, but uh by building up fluid in your lungs that uh is you know released after exposure and most uh, most uh fatalities have occurred within 48 hours of uh, you know an extreme dose now mustard gas um, you really see this being the gas that really affected soldiers' menta uh, mentality a lot because you could see it. It was a, um, uh, you know, again, it was, it was, well, it says it was colorless, but a lot of the soldiers describe it having a, a slight yellow tint to the, uh, uh, to the cloud or, or, you know, um, yeah, like, well, it's a, uh, yellowish brown in color, but, Mustard gas did two things. What one, so it, it would affect your lungs, obviously the same thing as the others, but it was also a blistering agent. So when it got on your skin, you would see, um, you know, burn, you know, burn like marks and blisters created uh, from exposure to the gas. So not only did you have to cover your face, but you had to cover, you know, this, uh, exposed skin as well. Uh, mustard gas actually had uh, a smell. Uh, similar to the uh, garlic, horseradish, or uh, rubber in, in, in its various forms, uh, but uh, but with the uh, um, the exposure uh, to the skin and especially the eyes as well, um, you know it was it had a very dramatic uh, effect on the soldiers. But only you know a very small mortality rate in this. You know a lot more casualties were created from skin irritation and and, and things like that. But one of the things about mustard gas too is that. <laughs> Um, it was a, um, a heavier gas. So as it floated across the battlefield, you actually, see, you know, you see the shell craters and the trenches. It would actually lie in the shell craters and um, not disperse very quickly. So you could actually have a soldier going across no man's land, jump into a shell crater where a gas attack had been, depending on the temperature, hours or maybe days before, and there would still be a pocket of mustard gas sitting there. Um, and they found that in winter, it would stay a very liquid form. And so if you had a shell explode near you and you didn't see immediately, you know, uh, a gas cloud um, in like the winter of 1917, um, the British actually had, when you go down into these dugouts underground, they had what was called a warming room or a warming hut. Whereas you came down, you'd actually have to sit in a separated room with two soldiers that had gas masks on and uh, let your body warm up in, in this warmer room. And if you started steaming, they would wrap you in wet blankets and take you up uh, back up to the trench and, and strip you naked because the gas uh, in its liquid state um, in, the, in the cold could actually penetrate your uniform without affecting you. And I, I suppose if it got on your skin, it'd probably start burning you. But if it got into your uniform, they had found that these soldiers were going down off a of night guard going down into their their uh, their um, their dugout and when they warmed up um, everybody in the dugout would be dead in the morning because now this soldier just basically off gassed all this mustard gas that was in his uniform and killed everybody in the dugout because it was a small confined space um, and so there were uh, un unseen uh, casualties from this but uh, but to go through again like it shows here chlorine uh, employed in a, in a, a number of different styles, like the 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 um, shell up to the upper right was launched out of a mortar. Um, it was called a, a British uh, cherry bomb. Um, it would fly kind of flipping around over the battlefield and explode over the enemy and, and spreading the uh, the chlorine gas. 
Um, uh, and again, it's just kind of going over the, uh, the same thing, but the interesting thing about this was it was water soluble. So if, uh, I think we just lost a bit Larry there, uh, Amy. Well, I'll keep going. Um, but, uh, so you could actually pour water on it and, um, you know, uh, stop the, uh, um, uh, stop the effects of the chlorine gas um on you at the time so uh moving the phosgene again uh 85 percent of the casualties were created from this it was six times more potent the chlorine gas very very extremely toxic um you know dangerous because it was colorless um and um, had a very uh, minor odor in the sense uh that could be just you know um mistaken for other things uh mustard gas again the king of the battlefield uh, or battle gases uh, and this is the one that most uh, you know, most soldiers describe uh, after the war as being exposed to. And, and Hitler, uh, Corporal Adolf Hitler in World War I, actually was gassed twice with mustard gas. Um, and you see the picture up to the upper right actually showing soldiers that had been exposed and were being treated with their skin. Uh, uh, you know, the, the blisters created on their skin from exposure to mustard gas. Uh, in many of these cases, too, uh, treatment for these the, uh, gas exposure um, in any of these cases, actually, his treatment was oxygen, uh, pure oxygen, uh, you know, because your lungs are having diminished capacity. And so the pure oxygen was, uh, you know, giving you a, a lifeline here. And so as uh, gas warfare became more and more common, uh, that uh, the supplies of oxygen uh, became very difficult to come by and uh again contributed to the the fatalities P uh painting is actually uh it's a huge painting i think it's like 20 feet long if i remember correctly and it's at the uh um, imperial war museum but this came out and was basically personified what gas warfare was and so all these soldiers holding on to the man in front of them they're all um, have bandages over their eyes and were being treated for exposure to mustard gas um, and, um, uh, so, and I, I apologize, I, I completely just, um, lost his name, but I think it was John Singer Sargent, uh, was the painter for this. And it was one of the most emblematic, uh, paintings or images of out of war one of gas, uh, or chemical warfare. Um, again, the deployment, um, in a number of different methods, but the picture to the right, you actually see, um, all these hoses going up over the top of the trench. Those are actually hoses coming from canisters, um, and those are Germans that are employing it. And so they would uh, basically have uh, numerous hoses going over the top of the trench and uh, would start deploying uh, this uh, gas uh, uh, gas warfare going over the top and hoping for a predominant wind blowing in that direction um, and or a prevailing wind. Uh, but quickly... Uh, you start seeing uh, both sides uh, developing artillery shells to develop or to deploy uh, the gas again um, on both sides. Um, like it says here, uh, it, a shell could hit without an expo explosion, but release the gas, um, creating the sound of a hissing sound as it's released and then a, a cloud around it as well. But the, the problem with that, too, is that as these barrages are taking place, you don't know if that shell that lands and explodes or doesn't explode um, is a gas shell or not. And so, you know, the gas attack could be at any time. And you're basically, you know, your first warning is somebody smelling one of these chemicals and, and making an announcement of a gas attack. And uh, they have these gas rattles that like the, the uh, New Year's party, uh, uh, the noisemakers where you're rattling it and spinning it around. Those started as gas rattles. Uh, to uh, as a loud signal to everybody in the trenches to um, you know put on their gas mask and if you think about it too um, so I've gone through chemical warfare training um, and you know you have to very quickly put your gas mask on seal it and then blow out uh, at least a modern gas mask to dispel uh, the chemicals uh, with inside uh, with the uh, inside of the mask um, in our training you know we had uh, basically CS gas. Um, which is, you know, is, is a form of, of tear gas. Uh, and it's, it's very unpleasant. Um, but, um, and then again, doing any kind of physical activity in it, um, you know, wearing a chemical suit or in this case, a gas mask and running 
you have to have a lot of confidence in your mask and uh, control your breathing because it's very easy to get uh, basically start hyperventilating or, or feeling like you want to just rip off your mask to get that breath of fresh air. Well, in, in this case, what, the reason why you have your mask on is it's not fresh air anymore outside. So, um, like I said here, um, in, as far as treatment and recovery, uh, average number of days uh, for recovery for victims was chlorine was about 60 days, phosgene was 45 days, mustard gas was six, uh, 46 days roughly. Um, and again, these, you know, the treatments were largely oxygen, uh, especially for chlorine and phosgene. Uh, mustard gas, uh, it was oxygen for the, uh, you know, the breathing problems. Uh, but to treat the skin, uh, you know, it was, it was a number of different ways. Like it says here, bathe in a hot soapy water to remove all chemicals from the skin. And if not, uh, you know, removed within 30 minutes of exposure, you'd have these big, the terrible blisters, like you see this poor guy up the top around his neck and on his wrist and, and um, uh, his armpit there, um, washing out your eyes and, and nose very quickly. And then, uh, but they'd have these portable shower units that uh, behind the front lines of cases so that, you know, units that were exposed, got back there, removed their uniforms, washed off and um, got to the front line. But keep in mind, that's within 30 minutes. And these trenches were not necessarily a very high speed place plus why are they attacking you with gas is that there's probably a subsequent attack taking place right after it so you know units would have to stay and hold their line um, and be you know um, rotated out when the, when the danger's gone obviously um, but um, and and again like it says here uh, in the same sense of that uh, exposure in the in the cold, one soldier having been exposed to mustard gas could actually spread it to other soldiers. Uh, and so even soldiers being treated uh, or the, the, the treatment, um, the nurses and the doctors and the medical staff could actually be exposed to it as well. So it was a very dangerous, longer living chemical. Than the others. Um, I always try to put in some personal accounts here. And so like this uh, British Sergeant Elmer uh, W. Cotton, he describes that men were uh, propped up against the wall, all gassed. Their color, color was black, green, blue. Tongue was hanging out. Uh, eyes were staring. One or two of them were dead. The others uh, were beyond human aid. Uh, some were coughing up with green froth uh, from their lungs. And so, again, you know, just it's a very, uh, you know, terrible way to die. And um, the uh, the very first uh, attack on the uh, um, Eep salient um, on the French and Canadian lines, um, the French lines were actually being held by French colonial so soldiers, uh, so uh, North African soldiers uh, that were known as Zouaves in their more fancy uniforms. But as their line started breaking and running, a British officer is describing it, saying a panic-stricken uh, stricken rabble of Turcos and Zouaves with gray faces and protruding eyeballs clutching at their throats and choking as they ran, many of them dropping in their tracks and lying on the sodden earth with limbs convulsing and features uh, and features distorted. So, it, again, all these descriptions, um, you know, really uh, just terrible. But uh, veteran Albert uh, Marshall here, he describes that these gases or exposure to these gases wasn't just a temporary thing. Where uh, veterans years after talked about. Like he says here that the gas is still with me today. It makes me itch every morning and at six every night. You can see all my skin all dry. Tonight my arm will itch from the top uh, to the elbow and will be back or it will be uh, and so will be the back of my neck. Sorry. Uh, it feels like a needle pricking you. And that's from 90 years ago. So very long lasting effects for these poor soldiers uh, going on. Uh, now, <laughs> there was, you know, they were re they were really trying to address uh, a lot of these psychological issues that were coming out of World War One, where you have um, shell shock. Uh, there was another one known as gas fright, and uh, where gas warfare is becoming even uh, just the threat of it becoming a, um, a psychological weapon, and you know. A lot of things happen to your mind when you put that gas mask on and now you feel like you're all alone in your little space here. And with this thought, like, did I get my gas on, or my mask on fast enough? Did it, you know, is it, is it sealed enough? Is it mustard gas that's going to burn my skin, you know, and uh, being broken down? 
uh, mentally broken down. And another one, uh, uh, another account here, it says, with men trained to believe that a light sniff of gas meant death and with nerves highly strung by being shelled for long periods of time with the presence of not uh, a few, uh, uh, the presence of not a few who really had been gassed, it is no wonder that the gas alarm went beyond all bounds. Gas shock was frequent as uh, shell shock. And so it was just, again, a, a mental breakdown uh, from the fear of just gas warfare. But I find it very interesting that the uh, the top right case is, uh, uh, it's a smelling case of war gases. And so there are very, very small amounts of what you might expect to see for different gases. And I found it very interesting in traveling through Belgium, uh, there was uh, uh, the Belgian National Museum um, actually had a section where you could go up and smell. Uh, it, I know it, it just seems like counterintuitive to want to go up and smell what the gas smelled like, but they had very similar smells to each one of these gases. And some of them were very, very faint. Some of them were, you know, like as described, like this freshly cut grass or hay. Uh, and these were things that... Uh, uh, you know, were shown to soldiers to see what to expect. And in very small doses, it was recoverable, uh, you know, that it was only with larger doses or, or thick clouds that, you know, uh, uh, you know, would be would be fatal in this case. Uh, but um, uh, like, like they, they by 1917-1918, like it says here, that the medics were actually having a hard time trying to a diagnose a real gas attack from these soldiers that, you know, coming back like, I smelled fresh cut grass or I, I smelled this and, and, you know, I must be exposed. So, you know, help me, you know, I, and, you know, we can psych ourselves up for anything and, you know, you're coughing because, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sick, I'm dying. And it's, uh, the example here shows the first of the 22nd London Regiment, one soldier reported a sore throat and that he had been gassed when there was no reports of a gas attack in the area. Within hours, 67 of the 105 men in the unit had been evacuated as gas casualties and being treated as gas casualties. Well, that one soldier just started this this trend and this, this panic going throughout the trenches of his unit, uh, you know, over this, uh, over a potential exposure, which turned out to actually not be real. So, you know, one of the, one of the other things we always try to do too is, is tie in, uh, you know, a local uh, uh, case here. And and while we didn't do anything at Rock Island Arsenal and uh, at the Savannah Army Depot, which was a, a subsidiary of Rock Island at the time during World War One, um, we didn't do any gas uh, production uh, or anything to do, um, as far as I know, my knowledge, to do with actual production or uh, employment of uh, gas warfare itself, but. Uh, what we did do at, uh, at Savannah is we had this large uh, firing range. And, and, and today, Savannah Army Depot is now a, a nature preserve. And uh, there are large ex uh, areas of uh, the uh, preserve that are uh, uh, limited to, to humans uh, or to human uh, contact because of potential live shells and, and debris there. But the, the picture to the upper right showing American soldiers firing a Stokes mortar grenade. Uh, or I'm sorry, Stokes mortar rounds, and the Stokes mortar rounds were one of the the main components that the uh, the Americans used in employment of um, at least close range uh, chemical warfare. And so while we weren't directly involved in, and in, to my knowledge, no gas warfare, um, you know, even testing was done at Savannah. Uh, the uh, the training for how to employ uh, chemical weapons was done there um, in a conventional sense. Um, so uh, that's that's one account there. Uh, but uh, uh, coming out of the war, um, you see, you know, thousands of soldiers um, on both sides dealing with, um, you know, the, the, the lasting effects of chemical warfare uh, being uh, blindness. Um, and actually, in, in Hitler's case, uh, Corporal Adolf Hitler, he was gassed twice and uh, he going through world war ii that was you know I, I don't know that he correctly came out and said he described how terrible it was being gassed and ha having survived um and having breathing difficulties for years afterwards uh but um you know it's one of the reasons why you see you know uh, all the belligerents in world war ii 
trying not to, uh, you know, employ gas warfare because of how dis- the, you know terrible it was seeing the effects during World War One. Uh, but uh, one of the the lasting effects that we even see till today is uh, uh, live gas rounds still being found all over the front line areas uh, in Belgium and France. Uh, and uh, in uh, 1925, the League of Nations actually approved the new Geneva Protocol, reinforcing a ban on chemical weapons, which, as we know from recent history with Syria and, and Iraq, uh, uh, is not always followed. But uh, but one of the interesting things, I, I, I actually traveled over to Belgium in a quick story here uh, and uh, uh, ta- I spoke with a number of uh, Belgian ordnance disposal tr- soldiers. And there was one case that they, uh, outside the town of Ypres, that the battlefields, uh, there was an attempt to clear battlefields of debris after the war. And um, around Ypres, there were three to four large uh, dump sites where uh, they would go out on the battlefield, find shells, and they would bring them back. And there was a large pit dug and then buried. Um, and they would just bury whatever they found, whatever war debris. And um, just recently, as the town of Ypres has expanded since its World War I border, boundaries borders, uh, they ran into it now on the edge of town. And uh, this was several years ago, but they, there was just a huge amount of artillery rounds and gas rounds and all kinds of stuff. And um, as they're excavating these rounds out, and the Belgian Ordnance Disposal has a special protocol to take it out to a base where they destroy it um, away from public uh, but as they're excavating it, they had to wait. There was a rail line nearby. There was roadways and schools nearby. They had to wait for winds, uh, uh, predominant winds going away from the town. Um, and so there was there was a lot of work that's still being done in that. And, uh, you know, just terrible how it's still so predominant. But um, so the overall statistics by Armistice, uh, 11 November 1918, Chemical weapons caused an estimated 1.3 million uh, casualties with over 90,000 deaths. So, you know, it, it while it doesn't seem in the grand scheme of things and uh, the total deaths during World War One that chemical warfare didn't cause as many as you, you would expect, there was that psychological effect that really had a, a large impact on uh, on the soldiers. Uh, but um, uh, the uh, official number of civilian casualties are, are not very well known, but this is where gas clouds, you know, continued floating past uh, the trenches and into civilian areas. But it was estimated to be about 5,200. Um, with the AEF combat losses, 52,800 battlefield fatal- fatalities. Uh, 1,500 of those died of gas-related injuries that are known. You know, again, it's it's tough to when you're looking at the statistics of this to um, I specifically identify, um, you know, gas related or gas caused fatalities. Um, but uh, what we do know is more than 124,000 tons of gas was produced by the end of World War I combined. So uh, with that said, that uh, very, still a very destructive uh, style of warfare and a, a very frightening um you know, uh, you, uh, um, weapon that was being used during the war. Um, you know, these were also uh, as part of, you know, uh, hundreds of other developments, you know, like the machine guns, the uh, the U-boat or the submarines, uh, you know, airplanes, uh, the Americans bringing shotguns into combat. And, and you know, so all these things were, um, you know, again, trying to get an edge over your enemy. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a, a very fascinating topic and something that we we re- revisit very frequently to try to learn from this and, and see how terrible war can be and hopefully not repeat it in the future. But uh, with that said, um, that's what I had. And so uh, if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Larry, did you have a question? I don't think so, Kevin. You did a great job. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry. I just saw the green circle around your, your name there. But, uh, but no, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us today. Um, and um, hopefully um, it answered some questions about uh, chemical warfare uh, in World War I. And um, kind of was a, again, all these talks are kind of wave top uh, coverage of, of these, these topics. But, uh, but thank you very much for joining us today. And um, 
Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in August. Yeah, thank you, Kevin, so much. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Mm. Amy, I think you have to turn the recording off too. Yeah, I am.